All right, let's look at advertising to mobile users. So uh, typically the device type that customers are using uh, is not a factor in the ad targeting when we're creating digital marketing campaigns. So we might segment or target our audience and all these sorts of variables, which, which makes sense, of course. Um, but device type doesn't often seem to be one of those. For example, if you've got to display ads on the Google Ad Network, uh, they show exactly the same ads on your desktop computer as what you would see on your uh, mobile phone. Um, now, this pulling of users from both device types, so it was people at their desk looking uh, on their desktop computer and people on the go on their mobile phones. Uh, so if you're sending the same marketing messages to the same people, um, it may not be optimal for the marketing campaign. It's not so much about the people. I know I said the same people, but I mean like at, the, at that time. So uh, my needs as an individual, as a consumer, might be different and I'll respond to different to marketing messages differently while I'm on my, uh, on my laptop or my desktop computer uh, compared to when I'm, I'm seeing them on my mobile phone. So if mobile users are less valuable uh, to the campaign, so your digital marketing campaign, the the bids should reflect this. So, what this means that is, uh, if you are if if you've developed a digital marketing campaign, you find out that the people on mobile phones aren't responding to your ads the same way that people on desktops are, then you shouldn't be paying the same price for people on uh, seeing mobile ads as compared to desktop ads. That makes sense, right? So, digital marketers should consider the differences then between mobile and desktop and the way that consumers react to those and design ads and especially the ad targeting to reflect these differences. Now targeting by, di by device types like to produce higher response rates. It's a lot harder to do because you've got to put more effort into it and you've got to do more analysis and stuff like that and the, in your targeting, um, well, in some situations it might not be there, in, in others there are there but you need to know what, what to do. All right? So it, a pulled ad campaign is when you're, when you're doing the same digital marketing to desktops and mobile. So the conversion rate on mobile ads uh, in the past was typically lower for uh, mobile than actually desktop advertisements. And even after all the develops in mobile marketing, mobile traffic is frequently less valuable than desktop traffic. Uh, and that essentially means that people tend to buy things more on their computers, on their desktop computers than on their mobile phones. Uh, and this implies that bid modifiers or bid adjustments should be used to optimize the digital marketing campaign. Now I'm going to give you an example of that coming up. So in Google Ads, there's I've got a screenshot here which shows um, a you know someone developing a digital marketing campaign, and you've got these things in there where you can put uh, modifiers in there uh, or what Google call uh, bid adjustments on there, and you can go uh, you can adjust the bids. Uh, so if you're just say if you're bidding on CPC like uh, cost per click or CPM cost per you know thousand views, um, you can adjust it by different variables so that you know one someone in one location you're paying that price and in another location you're paying that price. So location is going to be one way that you can adjust your bids, um, and and there's, there's lots of different ones. But we're going to look at um, devices, and you can actually do that, uh, but not many people seem to do it. So. If you've got a campaign that performs well on mobile devices with a maximum CPC bid of $1, um, to show your ad to more customers on mobile devices, so this is saying, well, we want to see, um, we want people on mobile phones, you know, we, we prefer the ads to be shown on mobile phones, um, then you can increase your bid by 20% for the searches on mobile devices. And this results in a final bid amount of $1. 20. So you're actually increasing your, your bid by, by that much. So you're prepared to pay more for that same ad to go to mobile phone users. And here's the basic math. Your starting bid is $1. Your mobile adjustments, so you're prepared to pay an extra 20% to go to mobile devices. Uh, so then your, your resulting bid for searches on mobile or display or whatever it is, devices, is basically $1.20. Uh, so in another example, let's say you have a $1 bid and you like to decrease it to adjust it to 80%, oh, sorry, 80 cents, or 0.88 dollars, and then you can actually decrease that by 20%. And that was sort of aligns with the example given before where a lot of digital marketers think that mobile traffic is less worthy, so then they're just going to reduce it. So then rather than um, your money just going to vote, like to pulled 
ones where it's going to both desktop and mobile, you're actually adjusting the bidding strategy to align with the value of that device type. Uh, if the modifier, oh, so the key question for digital marketers is how large that modifier will be. And that's going to, of course, be dependent on um, the, your marketing campaign and your uh, audience and how, how they respond to it, right? Now, so I can't tell you, but you, you got to work that out. And, and um, this is why we teach uh, analytics so much because a lot of these questions are just going to depend on the data that you got. Um, and how you analyze that and you can inform that decision making. So if, if, if when you do this, if you make the modifier too large, then it's basically you're wasting money on low value mobile impressions. If the modifier is too small, you miss out on valuable opportunity uh, advertising opportunities. So it goes back to my previous point, you've got to kind of align that modifier, which is going to change the bidding per the device type to the difference in value with that device type. So you need to know, well, um, I've developed a digital marketing campaign. It's gonna go out to both desktops and mobiles. From past experience, I know that, uh, just say, desktop users will respond 20% better than mobile users. So then you're gonna adjust that by, by, by 20%. So it's gonna favor the desktops. All right, now there's three considerations uh, digital, market digital marketers should consider when determining the value of mobile traffic. Um, the first one's directed attention. The second one is direct mobile purchasing. And the third one is fat finger clicks. So directed attention basically means that ads are only effective, like the only, the only work, if people give attention to the marketing messages. And those of you that have done consumer behavior, you, you already know about this and how, the importance of, of attention and how that works in the consumer decision-making process. But for those that haven't done that yet, um, uh, we, we don't respond to the stimuli that we don't process, all right? So if consumers are unaware of the ads, so if it means that it gets filtered out um, and we're not paying any attention to it, it has absolutely no effect on um, consumer behavior. Now, on display ad network, ads are displayed between paragraphs and users actually give them less attention because when you're scrolling, you kind of get to a display ad and you just sort of flick past it, hoping you don't click on it. On social networks, ads are displayed in the main feed and actually receive more attention. So if you're doing mobile and you want to do display ads, you've got to try then align the device type with the um, with the medium that you're using as well. So you might go, well, um, if we want to go mobile, we're going to sort of favor the social networks and especially ones like Snapchat and um, Facebook, Instagram, where they actually uh, pop up in front of, in front of your face. Um, and now mobile ads are more effective on social media than they are on display network. So that was the first consideration. The second consideration is direct mobile purchasing. So when mobile users cannot make an immediate purchase, mobile traffic is less value. So when they cannot or they, um, they don't really want to do this. So users may do primary search on mobile phone and then actually make the purchase on a desktop. And that kind of happens a bit. You might be um, waiting at the train station or waiting for a coffee or something like that. And then while you're waiting, you just do a quick search and you go, oh, what about this? So you're kind of putting in information. You're sort of feeding yourself information, but you're not really prepared to, to buy it right there. Then you get home um, and then you jump on the, the desktop computer and actually continue your purchasing decision-making process and, and complete the transaction there, right? However, many of the things that we search for on our mobile phones never actually materialize into actual conversions or purchases on, on, on desktops. So if mobile has lower conversion rates, mobile traffic then should be receiving lower bids. So that makes sense. Now, the last one is uh, fat finger clicks. So even though fat finger clicks, so we've talked about this previously in website design and mobile design. Um, so we're looking at from a, from a, you know, like a design perspective and the importance to reduce them as much as possible. But this is coming from the, the money side of things where we go, well, if it's happening, we need to be able to adjust our marketing campaign to factor that in. Otherwise, you're going to, you're basically wasting money on people that are clicking on your ads, which you're paying for, uh, that have no intention of actually purchasing stuff. It's just an accident. So even though fat finger clicks have reduced over recent years, that's still a problem for us as mar uh, for, di for dealing with digital marketing. Now, certain channels drive higher levels of this worthless traffic than others. Uh, and we've talked about it previously where uh, uh, in the past, some apps, like, like people have developed apps with the purpose of, you know, this fat finger clicking thing so people would accidentally click on the ads and then that would generate 
and it would seem like more people are clicking on their things so that digital marketers want to pay more for it. But, you know, we're not stupid, so we realise that these things, and uh, thanks to Google Analytics, we can actually tell, you know, how many people are coming to our website, how long they're staying, and the other metrics that they do on their website. So we go, well, um, users coming from that particular platform are very low value because either they leave immediately or they don't actually complete any other um, conversion metrics on, on the website. So you, you, need, you need to factor that in. You shouldn't be paying the same price for those. You think, oh, could we got lots of people coming to our website, but if they have no intention to go into the website, in actual fact works against you because they, you know, they're ending up on your website when they don't want to be there. Um, you, need, you need to, to fix that out. And then for one is, is better design, of course, but two, is you just, as digital marketers, we're going to go, well, we're not going to pay for that. We don't want to pay for clicks that aren't worth, worth, worth it. So um, uh, some mobile gaming apps are designed to drive large numbers of fat finger clicks. Be wary of that. In my experience, um, uh, not so much anymore because you know, we're onto it, so they, they adjust what they do based on what and we're paying. We're, we're paying for this advertising, so they're going to adjust their business strategy to align with what the market wants. Um, Google Analytics has a metric that counts visits with less than 10 seconds as bounces. Um, and I was reading this thing as well that if they go to the website um, and they leave again, so the way that Google Analytics works, it sort of records everything that they, like all the actions that happen on that website. So if they go to the website, that's action. Then scrolling is another action. Clicking is an action. So all these actions. But if they go there and then leave straight away, there's only one action. So they can't actually tell how long they've been on that website. So if they go onto that website and then don't do anything else, but then just leave, Google Analytics doesn't actually know how long they've, they've, they've been there for because there's no secondary action to compare with the first action. So you got you get a timestamp when they get there, but then nothing else um, or when they leave. But then um, whereas if they go to the website and then scroll and then another image loads and stuff like that, then then Google can Analytics can tell how long they've been there because there's a series of actions that Google Analytics is recording. So that's quite interesting. Right, now we've got uh, this idea of mobile-only ads. So instead of sending out to both desktops and mobile phones, you're just focusing on, on, on mobile phones. So developing digital marketing campaigns that only target mobile users that can utilize uh, unique targeting. So this can produce higher response rates than pulled campaigns uh, to both mobile and desktop, of course. So let's have a look at some of those. First one is uh, location-based targeting. And this is really cool. So I've got a, a Snapchat thingy up here. I remember when this came out, it was so cool. Uh, we we're drawing uh, GA fences around, you know, like areas. My first GA fence was all around Tasmania and it was ridiculously expensive. I was like, whoa, what's going on here? Because it's designed to be to be small, all right? So it's not like the state of Tasmania. GA fences are designed to be like, or you've got an exhibition going on, like, at a, you know, like just say there's an event going on at, um, you know, the exhibition centre somewhere. Um, and then you can draw a geo fence, or you go to the, the the football, and you know you go to the stadium, and you draw a geo fence around the stadium. There's a lot of people in there. You want everyone at that stadium to get an ad based on you know that that relates to the content that they're watching. So it's really it's really exciting. Um, you can also so that's where you draw geo fences in there. But the, the I think the default one is still this circle one. So um, for example, restaurants. Uh, oh, sorry, geofencing allows marketers to target ads based on the radius from a specific location. So that one's got the radius on there. Um, and you just scale it, you, you slide that thing backwards and forwards, and then it just makes a scale bigger or smaller. It's in American ones, so it's in miles, but the Australian, if you log in with the Australian website, it's actually in kilometers. So for example, a restaurant could target ads to users within one kilometer of their business, which makes sense because if you're doing mobile and then you get an ad, you're say, basically saying, you know, um, it makes sense if you get an ad on your mobile at that particular location at that particular time that that's sort of in the facility of the market that you're looking for for food and stuff like that. So advertisers can set up exclusion loads to exclude ads from geographic locations and you can do that to be more specific with your targeting uh, then as well. You can actually zoom in on your uh, geo fencing using the exclusion zones as well. So you don't want this area but within that area I don't want that area. So it gets a little bit tricky but you can do it. Uh, and and um, social media applications uh, find out that the more features that they give to us as digital marketers, uh, the more value we can get out of these applications and then uh, um, the more money they make. So Because we get more value out of them, we to spend more money in there and then they get more money out of it. So location-based targeting uh, is based on the user's estimated location. This is quite important. It's not 
an exact location. And that's true for many of them. Uh, like Facebook's very much like that because uh, you have to give permission to you for Facebook to use your um, uh, GPS and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of people don't do that. Um, I do because I don't really care. Uh, but Snapchat's different in that way because I think you have to do it because if you go to Snapchat, you go to Maps, you can get very precise. Like you, you look at your own maps on Snapchat, you can see exactly where you are, like what house you're at. Um, so uh, most of them aren't exact location, um, but um, Snapchat gets pretty close. Right, habitat, oh, sorry, not habitat, habit targeting. So consumer behavior also varies according to um, people's habits. Now, habits are routine behaviors that are repeated regularly and tend to occur subconsciously. And I'm thinking of a habit like, uh, you know, like I go to work in the morning and then I'll go with a group of friends and we'll go down to the cafe and we'll get a coffee. Now that happens like nearly every single day. Um, like you, people just need a coffee in the morning. So uh, from that perspective, when we do digital marketing, we can factor in those habits uh, into the way that we um, communicate with these people. So targeting based on people's online behavior, which can adjust for, uh, oh, so this research here, um, uh, is, is actually pretty exciting. So it's uh, JCR, the Journal of Consumer Research. It's a very reputable journal. And this research found, I think this was published in Australia off the top of my head, I can't remember, I've, 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 there's a few of them, um, that targeting people uh, based on their online behaviour, uh, it can actually adjust people's self-perception of themselves and then impact their actual purchasing behavior. I'll just give a random example. Uh, if if I'm basically targeting your past behavior and go, hey there gardener, you're really good at gardening or, you know, be the gardener you always wanted to be or expert gardeners like you deserve good gardening tools or something like that. So basically I'm saying to you, you're, you're, a, you're a gardening person, which I'm not at all, but um, then I might go, oh, oh you know, these ads think that I'm a gardener, then people start to believe that they are. And that happens in real life. Um, we adjust our perceptions of self based on their so, uh, si social situations and situational context, uh, and, and it happens with marketing too. So, um, And then if I think that I'm a gardener, I'm much more likely to buy gardening products. Uh, customers also behave differently on weekdays compared to weekends and mornings compared to afternoons and on the holidays and stuff like that. So we can, we can see all that and then we, we know that. So if you know that uh, when you do your developing your digital marketing, you could actually be targeting uh, people on the weekends because they know on weekends they go to Bunnings. So if you do, do a digital marketing for Bunnings, you go, right, we want to focus um, on weekends because we can see from previous behavior that's when they, they buy the most and we want that, reduce that lag time. Or you might have, you know, you might have a really good, conversion tunnel work it out we go we know that they spend all their money at bunnings on the weekend but they do most of their research about bunnings but looking at bunnings websites and stuff like that during the week so we want to smash them during the week and then do it on the desktop where they do their research and then on the when i say smash them, i mean like give them like like promote your stuff on the on during the week on the desktop where people are doing looking things up researching it working what to buy and then on the weekend we're going to push uh, pay a lot more and promote mobile marketing when they're actually on the go buying things. Um, so that's obviously that campaign is going to be optimized and be a lot more effective than just, you know, like, like when you don't know what you're doing, you just push everything out the same way. Uh, digital marketers should be aware of customer habits and how this impacts their advertising. Now, weather targeting is really cool. I, I don't know a lot about this, but it seems exceptionally exciting. Um, the weather has an impact on human behavior, and I know this from science. I teach this in consumer behavior, um, and this includes, so when I wrote this, I was thinking human behavior, such as if it's raining, you don't actually want to go outside and walk to your car because you get wet. Um, and you might go, oh, let's go you know, to the park for a picnic. Oh, no, it's raining that day. Let's cancel it next day. So obviously it has an impact on human behavior, but it also has a direct impact on buying and selling. Now, research shows that temperature, um, oh, I don't have this research in there, but I did have, and I swapped it out for this one, which is actually really cool as well. So the research by, the, by this group of people here, they show uh, that humid that temperature, so the you know how hot it is, uh, the humidity, um, whether it's snowing or not. Oh, so this is uh, sound like American. Especially sunlight can actually affect retail sales of the individual. So I'm not talking about market. We're talking about individuals themselves. Now this happens. This mainly happens by the psychological mechanism that impacts people's mood, um, which we call modes of effect. So if it's sunny outside, people are generally happier and, and got uh, better improved moods 
And when that people are in a better mood, they're a lot more likely to um, uh, purchase on these um, hedonistic products. Hedonistic means things that are fun, all right? Uh, now, digital marketers can actually use weathering, weather marketing platforms, such as I've never used this one before, but it looks really cool, to optimize their bidding based on the weather. So you say, if it's sunny, I'm prepared to pay this much. However, if it's raining, I'm prepared to pay less because the, my ads, while it's raining, are less effective. So I'm only prepared, uh, you know, I'm not prepared to pay as much for them, which is, which is, is, is I think it's kind of cool. Um, now, social context. So consumers respond differently to marketing communication according to their social context. This is, for example, this is when they're alone. So people behave differently when they're alone. And this includes, the, you know, like the way that they respond to marketing messages or when they're with friends, with their social groups um, uh, or when they are together with their with their family. And um, when this, this kind of makes sense, if you think about it, uh, when you're alone, you're going to be thinking about satisfying the needs that you have when you're alone. And this is the same. I'm not talking about different people. Here, I'm talking about the same person. Um, uh, so when I'm alone, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got different needs and thinking about different things. Uh, when I'm with my friends, it's a lot more, you know, you've got to fit in with the social group and you're probably more likely to go out for a beer and stuff like that. Um, uh, or when you're with your family, you're thinking about doing things as a fam family, right? So a lot more family orientated and, and, and the, the needs that you have are a lot more less individualistic, a lot more communal, right? So, uh, we can think about, this from a marketing perspective and, and, and target that. Um, now, I've got at the bottom here, I might just do this bit here. So current data limitations make this targeting difficult. It, it does happen. And Facebook tried it, but it dropped off. It was basically saying um, the social context of the person is at that moment. You could use that to target the thing. So when they're with friends, you send this ad. When they're alone, you don't send, you know, you send a different ad. Or you'll go, I'm only going to send this uh, ad to people uh, when they are within their friend group. Um, so, but they're still evolving and um, there are privacy issues, a uh, bit of kickback because people don't like to be targeted in that way uh, too much. So social context ads, uh, sorry, social content ads connect ads, so the advertisements to the actions of friends who are already connected with the promoted brand or object. And this is research here. So that's pretty cool. So basically it's referral ads. So uh, if if you, we develop a, a campaign, you go, I want to send this to everyone and I'm just going to pull out a random product here. Just say if I'm going to sell a car and um, it's a, um, I'm, I'm, like a Subaru, I, I can't remember the name of it, but it's um, a car, um, the adventure one where, you know, it's got um, a man and a lady and they've got the dog in the back of the car and they go out camping and stuff like that. So they go, well, I'm going to promote it to people that have a, an adventurous lifestyle. So they like those kind of pages. Um, but I also want to promote it to people, uh, like their friends. So basically you're using um, the profiles of their friends to target uh, the people that, that see the ad. So if I've got uh, a lot of friends that like to do outdoor activities and, and engage with those outdoor activities pages, then I will see um, that ad as well. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. So we're going to leave it there. Uh, for this section, I'm going to do marketing through mobile apps and the future of mobile.